fortunate today to have Wendy Wagner visiting us from the University of Texas, where she is the Joe A. Warshall Centennial Professor. And it's extremely impressive. Yeah, and it actually is not at all, but <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, Wendy received her Master's of Environmental Studies at Yale and her law degree at Yale. Um, before she began teaching, she practiced for four years um, as an honors attorney in the Enforcement Division of the Department of Justice's Environment uh, and Natural Resources Division, then as a Pollution Control Coordinator with the Department of Agriculture's Office of the General Counsel. Um, she has served on two National Academies of Science committees, on the Bipartisan Policy Center Committee on Regulatory Science, and she currently serves as a consultant to the Administrative Conference of the United States. Um, uh, Professor Wagner has um, written a number of books and articles, which I'm not going to start to list, but she's won a number of really impressive awards for those articles. Um, and she is going to be discussing her current work, for which I believe you or, or which is related to a National uh, Science Foundation grant. That's right, right. Um, which I thought sounded fascinating. I'm really looking forward to this uh, empirical work and to Wendy Wagner. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, well, I've had a great time here. It's such a beautiful place and such nice students. We're very, very lucky. Um, and I know you have a wonderful dean because he's my favorite. So. Hats off to you. All right, so I'll get into this. I want to start, though, probably more orientation than I normally would um, to describe the project and also kind of the backdrop of the questions I'm asking because it's going to be pretty easy to get caught in the weeds, and that's really fine. We can talk about that, but what I really want to talk about is the big picture. I'm actually, this particular paper is about done. Um, so it's basically out the gate. It's fine. I, I don't mind, but it's at a formative period in this larger study. So this is actually part of a pilot study, what we're, we're talking about today, that then led to an application to the, the National Science Foundation for a larger empirical study, so it kind of was the seed. Now in this larger uh, NSF grant, it's going to probably take up in the next five to six years of my life. And we're only in year one, and we're really at a sort of a massive data collection stage. And we haven't stepped back, I don't think, and thought about the larger questions or how to approach them. So that's a long way of saying this is in a very formative phase in, um, in, the, in the larger project. And so this paper fits in. Uh, we're not going to exactly duplicate the methods, but it's kind of germinating how we want to approach it. So I'm very eager for your feedback, particularly at the big picture level on what we're looking at, how we're asking it, and particularly the blind spots, which I'm sure are there, um, that are starting to frame how we're going to start to approach the data, probably this summer, actually, in trying to figure things out. So in terms of the larger issue and what started this, my background is in regulatory science. I'm an environmental lawyer. I never taught ad law. I don't really necessarily want to teach ad law. Um, and I never did empirical work before. And frankly, didn't really want to do empirical work either. Um, and after doing this, I'm not sure I want to spend the next five years doing it. But with all that said, um, I started this project because of a concern I had. Um, and I'll, I'll back up later, but basically at the big picture level, the concern is that the administrative process that we built uh, to handle agency accountability, the way we hold agencies accountable for all the rules we do, sort of came into being in the 40s in the Administrative Procedures Act and was kind of significantly amended in the 60s and 70s, and I'll, I'll drop back and talk about that history. Um, but that's really where it came from, and the idea, the major mechanism for making sure agencies are accountable is a pluralistic engine. The idea that all the stakeholders will come, um, they'll all comment, and then they'll all use, as they see fit, judicial review to hold the agency's feet to the fire. So how do we make sure this fourth branch is actually being accountable? We have some supplemental mechanisms, but the main mechanism is a reliance on pluralism um, and judicial review. Okay, my concern is, fast forward 40 years, and things actually in the regulatory state look lot, a lot different than they did even in the 60s and 70s. Um, the, the agencies are coming out with probably five to ten times more rules than they were in the 70s. And the, at least, and I haven't benchmarked this, but I feel pretty good about this, that at least in EPA, the preambles um, and the rulemaking records are probably about ten times bigger per rule than they were in the 70s. In other words, the rules were very short, the preambles were very simple, 
in the 70s, and now it's tenfold bigger. All right, so we throw that against the idea that we have pluralism, and specifically here I want to think about interest groups, public interest groups coming in, and they're all of a sudden finding there's a lot more to comment on, a lot more to sue about, and a lot more time is spent per rule engaging. So my concern was, you know, this pluralistic engine for agent accountability may actually not be working very well. Now, if that's the case, then we have actually not very sufficient mechanisms for holding the agencies accountable to the public interest. But more perversely, in my view, is that the, the institutional design we have actually may, in some settings, not in all settings, perversely set us backwards. And this occurs because if we have, in some settings, a monolith, we have only industry, for example, in environmental rulemakings, participating, using the threat of judicial review against the agencies, if that's actually occurring, then judicial review actually may push us away from the public interest. So if the agency is mission-oriented and want to do the right thing and they're in that balance, they're in that equipoise trying to do the right thing, if all the comments are from industry and all the threats of judicial review are from industry, then actually we may be worse off with judicial review in some settings than better off. So a very perverse effect. This worries me actually enough to do this junk, um, which is, is not that easy, and that was sort of what framed the study. So to do a little bit of, of history, just really quickly, as I understand the administrative process, um, in, in the beginning, in the 1900s in the administrative state, primarily what we had uh, was economic regulation. Uh, we were concerned about industries monopolizing, price fixing, maybe misbranding, but the mo main focus was really on the market. Um, and in the mid 1940s, when the Administrative Procedures Act was passed, that was the administrative state it was entering into, and the use of the courts was really in a due process sense. It was used by regulated parties in economic regulation, essentially to protect their interests against the regulators who were arbitrarily regulating. So that was the framework for the APA. That was how it was designed. Fast forward to the 60s and 70s, and all of a sudden we have this huge glut of social regulation. Congress is passing statutes upon statutes, you know, five a year, not, well that's an exaggeration, a couple a year, um, protecting public health, protecting the environment, protecting workers. All of a sudden, there's a real social regulation. Uh, we're, we're trying to engage the public in this protection. So all of a sudden we have a dilemma. You know, we created the system with sort of a due process where industry sort of protects itself against arbitrary economic regulation. What are we going to do now that we have sort of these immediate beneficiaries of all this public health stuff? The courts looked at this, and at the same time, let me say, very important, there was increasing evidence of capture. Uh, that in economic regulation in particular, industry was an agency's back pocket, there was a raw ball and door, you know, all this crazy stuff. So there was evidence, too, that the agencies, even in economic regulation, were already captured. So the courts looked at this picture in the 60s and 70s, and they said, well, the logical thing to do is expand standing so that anyone in the United States can sue the agency, hold them accountable, essentially. Um, now, in the 60s and 70s, um, the idea that we would expand standing to let anybody challenge the agency is arbitrary actually looks very different than it does to us today. Um, and Stewart wrote this, you know, this classic article, The Reformation of American Administrative Law in the 70s. But if we step back and think about it, um, this was actually a very scary thing that the courts on their own were doing, expanding standing. It made sense because we wanted those beneficiaries to be able to engage. Otherwise, only regulated industry could sue the agency for inadequately protecting public health. So we needed to do something to expand it. It seems logical. But the concerns were, who's going to be using this? I mean, abusive process, almost like uh, tort reform. You know, everybody's going to be coming in here, saying they represent the public interest, doing whatever, holding the agency's feet to the fire to lane. We're just going to see a glut of the system. It's going to be a complete disaster. And by the way, look at the agency's role, uh, the court's role now. It's instead of sort of adjudicating due process, you know, have you arbitrarily infringed on this industry who's suing? You know, the courts are now saying, is the agency essentially doing the right thing from the public interest, from diverse stakeholders? That's a very different kind of framework with the same kind of questions. So this transformation was actually pretty radical. And there were a lot of concerns about what kind of things would come out of the woodwork in the 60s and 70s. Well, as in law always, we never know. When the dust settled 10 years later, everything looked pretty good. People were pretty pleased. And the little empirical evidence that was done, and let me say a lot more was done then than is being done now, said, you know what? 
The public interest groups are definitely heavily engaged, but they're engaging responsibly. We're not seeing an abusive process. And even more important for purposes here, um, I have a whole paragraph of quotes in another paper. James Q. Wilson, everybody that was looking at this said, pluralism is alive and well. To the extent there were any concerns that public interest groups wouldn't be engaged, refuted by the 70s. They were out there, they were actually ahead of industry, they were using the courts at least as much as industry. They were really on their toes. And all the research said, we got pluralism. The engine's working. Stop. Nothing more was done, essentially. Now, I looked at the story, which is the story I heard in administrative law and still hear today when I go to conferences, that pluralism's alive and well and everybody's engaging. And I look in my area of environmental regulation, which is very tedious, science-based toxics. And what I saw anecdotally was the opposite. I saw industry blowing away everything, and the public interest groups weren't even in the room. Just completely unbelievable. Threatening to sue, anecdotally. So the story I saw was, no, the pluralistic engine isn't alive and well. Whatever was going on in the 70s has changed, or maybe it wasn't even accurately reported then. Things were different. So I thought, well, all I can do is whine about it. You know, I don't know how else to do anything beyond anecdotes. And then a study came out in 2006 by a very young set of whippersnappers, a political scientist and her, and her husband lawyer, uh, Jason and uh, Susan uh, Yaki, I think I said that early on, in 2006. And they actually did an empirical study very easy. You know, they just counted who was engaging in 40 set of rules across four different agencies and had a cute little test for seeing whether the rule changed from proposed to final. And I thought, oh my gosh. You know, this is something law professors can do. It's just counting administrative <laughs> records. And if I'm really this annoyed by what I view as an uh, incorrect view of administrative process in 2012 or 2010, you know, I really should do this. Um, and so I got other people together, and so we started it. Um, and the way we approached <coughs> it, and this was very wise, and there's a variety of reasons we ended up doing it. It wasn't necessarily the way I would have started. Was we started with a pilot study. And we said, let's take... By the way, we know so little about administrative process empirically. Nobody studies it, and there's a lot of reasons for that, I have learned. But um, because of that, you almost can't subsample. Because you, you you know, you're just going to get way too much variation, your apples and oranges, how do you think about it? And so the statistician said, okay, you're going to do a study like this, pick one set of rules and study every single one of them, and make sure they're as similar as possible. So the way we approached it was, <coughs> we said, okay, we're going to do an EPA, EPA is what I know, and we're going to do uh, air toxic emission standards. So EPA, in 1990, was charged by Congress to promulgate emissions control standards for the toxics being emitted from large industries. Okay, so large amounts of toxics, and it does it by industry sector by industry sector. So it says, steel, here's your air toxic emission standards. Uh, cement kiln, here's your air toxic. And they do 90 sets of industry, actually 112, but we came down to 90. So we picked those because, first of all, they're technical, they're tedious, they're long, they're hard. So it did suggest that if industries involved heavily, we're going to see them playing heavily in here. But the public interest is very implicated. This is the only regulation we have of air toxics. And we're talking hundreds, thousands of tons of air toxics annually from just one industrial sector. So yes, um, public interest is implicated. So that's what we picked. And we did all, every single rule, um, looked at 90 to 100. Now, the other nice thing about this set of rules was EPA started promulgating these in the early 90s and ended in late 2000. They're not exactly equally split between Clinton and Bush too, but more or less. So that was kind of a nice feature too, so we could almost ideally test presidential administration in this whole nine yards. What we did was very simple. Um, we got the administrative records, and EPA has unbelievable record-keeping practices that are beautiful. And it has a, a docket that's usually about 150 pages long, and they basically log in every single thing they did. And then we had student coders, um, started out with law students, ended up with undergrad. Um, you can imagine how much law students love to do this work in the summer, right? Okay, all the lessons you learn the hard way. So if you do this stuff, trust me, start with undergrad. So anyway, so we did all this, um, and we said they coded these 150 pages times 90, and told us he was engaging, <coughs> and then, and, and more or less following Yaki, I mean, we kind of modified the methods actually quite a bit, but not in any ways that are worth discussing. And then we also said, well, uh, it doesn't matter just who engages, does it matter to the outcome? And so we looked at uh, the changes the agency said it made in the final rule based on notice and comment, and the agency always had a little section that says, these are the changes we made based on notice and comment, and we literally coded that. 
um, had the students, how many changes, are they weak and strengthening, are they paper working, a whole bunch of criteria. And we did intercoder reliability, which basically means we would double code some of this blind and see whether the student answers match so that we had a sense of reliability of the data because it was soft coding, but it was specific enough that I think we were able to do pretty well on that front. So that's all the data we collected and how we did it. Um, now, study number one reported just on the influence of interest groups throughout the rulemaking process for these 90 rules. How do we extrapolate this beyond? We don't know. That's why we got an NSF grant to look at four different agencies and drill down. But what we saw basically vindicated exactly what I was concerned about. In fact, it was even worse than I thought in terms of industry dominance throughout the rulemaking process. I'll show you a little bit of that later. Um, but step two, which is the study I want to talk about now, and I told you there'd be a long wind-up. This was my slide for the long wind-up. Um, was, um, okay, so after we understand how interest groups engage, how do the courts fit in? How many of these 90 rules go to court? Who's bringing them? What do the courts do with them? What happens after the court opinion? You know, what is the role of the courts? Um, and so that's the study I want to talk about today. And the questions I asked were basically, um, you know, how many of those rules get challenged? Who's challenging them? What happens? What happens to the rules after the judicial decisions? And let me just tell you, and this could be, this could be me reading the administrative literature, and Professor Johnson, I'm sure, will shut somebody straight if I'm wrong here, but this is what I expected going into the study, okay? I expected, and I, this was an overstatement, but the literature basically said about 80% of the rules that EPA promulgates that are important get litigated. Do you remember this? Um, and people now have said, I don't, I'm not sure it's that high, but the idea is that lots of the rules that EPA uh, promulgates get litigated. So I expected a very high litigation rate out of those 90 rules. Um, I expected, based on the huge involvement of industry, that most of the lawsuits would be industry. Um, that they would not only be you know, sort of taking over the rulemaking process, but pounding the agency into the wall. Um, in, the, in the litigation stage. Um, I also expected most of the cases would be unsuccessful. If, if not harassing, at least not successful. I'm sure to the extent you remember administrative law and you don't do it, highly deferential, right? So the agency's granted a whole ton of deference and we would see therefore a lot of the cases get passed through is what I expected. Um, and when the agency does get nailed, we would expect the agency to be freaking out. You know, the Office of General Counsel turning itself inside out because it got a negative opinion. Does that summarize what we'd expect? Opposite on every score. So much so that my paper has terrible ADD because I was just flipping out at every score. So let me take you down. <laughs> and, you know, again, this is one set of rules. Who knows what this means? We'll find out. Um, so I want to start with the big picture here. This is uh, basically all our data. Now, the little dashed line is industry, and the blue is public interest. And I'm taking you here through the rulemaking process. Pre-NPRM stands for pre-notice of proposed rulemaking. This is before the proposed rule is even developed, before it's published. And this takes about three years. The agency's kind of working on it. So this is, uh, out of 90 rules was our N. Industry was engaged, and I'll show you how much later, in all 90 rules, they were logged into that docket, and the public interest groups were logged into only 12 of those 90 rules in the development. We can talk about that, that's not really shocking in kind of sight. Um, at the comment stage, where you actually file comments during notice and comment, interest groups only participated in about half of the rules, actually less than half. This is important because they're waiving their, uh, you know, they're sort of potentially waiving the ability to challenge. They're not exhausting administrative remedies on half those rules, more than half. So all of a sudden, um, unless there's comments in the record that help the public interest groups, we've just lost half of them from any public interest accountability. Um, and then petitions after the final rule is published, you can actually petition the agency, say, we're going to sue you. Uh, this is a whole other area that I'd like to get at, but we have to get at through Florida, um, because most of these settle. And it's all off the record. Um, and this is where I want to go <coughs> on the litigation to judgment, uh, the ones that got litigated. So surprise number one on this graph, wow. 90 rules, and by the time you add it up, it's only seven cases, because the industry intervened in two of the environmental cases. Less than 8% of the rules pass through the courts. Not at all what I expected, and also suggests, you know, the courts are basically not involved in a lot of rules, right? So judicial review is, is by, in this set of rules, by far the exception. Um, a couple more surprises that I'll come back to. Industry brought one case out of 90 on its own. So I'll come back to that, not what I expected. 
public interest made much more aggressive use of the courts than industry. Not what I expected. They filed six cases, you know, out of 90 or 42. Still not tons, you know, so uh, that I was not uh, necessarily amazed at. Um, but they were using it more than the agency. So now I want to talk about public interest, I'll come back to industry. So in terms of the public interest, um, one thing to just note is why are they sort of so low? I did some qualitative interviews, I should have done more, and certainly in our NSL study we'll do a lot of interviews. Uh, the explanation I was given repeatedly, emphatically, was we don't have the resources, um, it takes a week at least to file a decent set of comments, and we have to pick our battles carefully, and so we just simply don't have resources. It does not mean that we like all these, okay? Um, so that's, that's step one number one. We're not seeing the courts heavily engaged, but what happens when they are? I would expect them to be passing most of these through. Um, so these are the cases, um, and I have win or lose by each of them. They're plotted against time. These are the ones brought by the public interest groups. These are the ones by industry. And in the parens, I don't even know if you can see it, but I have, you know, it, and it doesn't really matter, but just because I'm so obsessive compulsive, you can see on the left of the paren of it, the issues that they won, because there's usually multiple issues, in the, and the one to the right of the colon is the issues they lost. But what you can maybe see is the wins and loses on the back. Um, EBA won one of seven cases. They lost six. So EPA was getting totally nailed, and the public interest groups who brought six won five of them. So how did they win them? What did it look like? Boy, that was surprising. <coughs> Courts aren't very involved, but when they are, they're basically uh, finding EPA you know, doing something wrong. So what, 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 what were they getting uh, nailed on? Another surprise for me. You all remember Chevron, or nobody would want it if they don't. Mm -hmm. um, Chevron is essentially saying we want to give the agency a great deal of deference, so what's the test? Step one is the statute unambiguously uh, shows that this is the right result and you're over here. You violated the unambiguous statutory provision. That's Chevron step one. Chevron step two is, oh, the statute's ambiguous. Are you in your policy space, roughly? Um, I had always thought most of the challenges were more step two. I mean, I, that's at least how I always thought about it. The public interest groups out of those six cases raised nine Chevron step one and one eight of them. So virtually every single case they won was based on Chevron step one. The statute unambiguously showed they were in violation of the law. Now they brought a bunch of step two and they lost those. And I think that's kind of consistent with the deference. Actually the deference occurs here. But they're violating the statute, essentially. Um, industry, by the way, interestingly, didn't bring any Chevron step one challenges. In a little litigation it did, and when it did, um, it actually did okay in the one case it won. All right, so I look at this and I say, okay, well the courts aren't very involved, but when they are, wow, I mean, they're winning? The, whoever's suing, including industry, is winning, and they're winning on step one. So this is an extremely important role of the courts. So then I can sort of go back into my chair and relax and say, yay, you know, the courts do matter, it's a big deal, and the precedential effect is much larger on Chevron step one, obviously, than Chevron step two. So I feel really good about it. And so I would expect then the agency to jump too. You know, all of a sudden, big changes. <clears throat> this is really where I was shocked. Um, and again, I, this could be totally aberrational. We can talk about that. So, I discovered that on these two, two 2007 cases where EPA got dinged, uh, mostly on, on uh, well, mostly on Chevron stock one, it turned out in this case, EPA uh, was challenged on five issues, lost on five. Four of the five had been decided before by the D.C. Court of Appeals. And when this panel, two Republicans and one Democrat, looked at EPA's rule, they said, we can't believe it. We told you before in um, line and before then, cement kiln, this is what the statute means and you have completely violated it. So four of these five and one of these two issues in the opinions took EPA to task essentially for blowing the DC circuit off eight years before. I had not expected that. That was not what administrative law had taught me. Now, first explanation, and by the way, in the other issue that EPA lost, uh, they had actually made up a strange exemption for the statute that didn't exist in the legislative history. And when I actually got the PowerPoints out of the docket, 
the administrative EPA was briefed that this was a huge high-risk strategy to create this exemption. There was absolutely no statutory basis for it, but, you know, why not? Okay, so when I looked at this, um, I first think, and I still think, that one of the best explanations for these two cases is Bush W. That he just had his agenda and he didn't care. And I like that story because it suggests that at least this set of rules is not at all you know, sort of symbolic of what might be going on beyond this, but it's an administration-specific thing, although it does still worry us about administration. But, you know, I actually found enough circumstantial evidence that I'm actually not sure that is the only story. Um, first of all, um, there's a whole literature on non-acquiescence in administrative law, and they all kind of worry about agencies explicitly non-acquiescing. And everybody says, isn't this problematic? We need them not to non-acquiesce. But nobody seems to talk about the fact that maybe they're always non-acquiescing. You know, maybe this is actually a big problem, and that they only listen to courts when it's convenient, um, and not necessarily, you know, all the time the way we would think as lawyers. But what I guess what worried me even more is then I looked at the political science literature, and this is what they've been saying. They said, "Why do you, in administrative law, you lawyers, think courts are affecting what the agencies do? You know, they have the elections, they have the White Houses, they have Congress, they have budgets." <coughs> I have a quote from Jerry Mashaw. He says, uh, as a result of this gap between theory and empirical knowledge about the impact of judicial review, doctrinal discussions, which there are many of in administrative law, Mead, Chevron, you know, all these different things, may ultimately seem like cartoons when laid beside the occasional empirical investigation of operations. When I started thinking about it, I thought, you know, why would an agency care what a court says? If it's highly inconvenient, you know, what actually would cause them to care? And if that's true, then what makes us think <laughs> judicial review is a big deal to them? Um, it's great when it helps them, but if it doesn't, you know, just forge on ahead. Oh, so anyway, that was a big surprise. Uh, and I hadn't expected to find it. It's so tiny. We're talking about a couple cases under Bush W. It definitely deserves more investigation, it seems to me. I'll be curious to see what you say. Second surprise, though, on the same front. So environmentalists might make a little bit of a you know, ripple in these cases with Chevron Step 1, go home, woohoo, and it turns out the agency doesn't, you know, not acquiesce. It's I'll only do it if it's convenient. That's disappointing. Even more disappointing was this. Not expected. Environmentalists still can say, okay, well, we won five cases, and the agency had to redo the rule, you know, for the opinion. Well, what do you think happens? They don't redo the rule. So this is a timeline of the years after the court's opinion. I have five cases that got vacated and remanded. One, actually, the court was able to repair on the spot. It said two features of this rule are wrong, pull them out, and the rule stands. Okay? So that's why I only have these five cases. This is the only one that got repaired, the only rule that's actually gone through back to a final rule after it was vacated, and it took EPA 10 years. Okay. This is the timeline. I hope I didn't mess up your screen. This is the timeline on the others. Artiva was brought by two industries, two specific industries. That rule has not been in effect for basically eight years. The data's a little bit older. There's no rule governing toxic air emissions. The environmentalists, sadly to say, also enjoyed victories with rules vacated and remanded, but there's no rules in place. So it's a little bit of a hollow victory. Oh, wow, you know, EPA's bad rule got pulled, but there's no rule in the meantime. <laughs> so the states are essentially kind of making up the difference. Just amazing. And a lot of it has to do with the remedies, I think. Um, there's no remedies, no timeline set. Um, but in any event, not what I expected on any level um, in terms of what's going on in administrative process. And when I look and dabble, the idea that the agencies may not be repairing actually has resonance. It has resonance in this old uh, Shuck and um, um, Elliott study, back to the Chevron station that hopefully very few people know. Um, and uh, it has resonance actually in Emily Mizell has just come out with an article in Columbia Law Review. It has a little bit of resonance there. So it resonates. Um, and nobody's looked at this before, so who knows what this means. All right, so now let's take a look at industry. That's really the most interesting puzzle, isn't it, in a way? Um, that these big resourceful guys undoubtedly don't lack resources to bring an appeal, right? Um, why are they only finally one case? All speculation, I'll give you my circumstantial evidence. One case and an intervening two. So let me give you the background, this is from the other study, of what their engagement actually consisted of. 
The white is industry, the little sliver is public interest, and this is state. This is a chart of the engagement during the rule development process, pre-NPRM, before the proposed rules issued. Industry engaged in roughly, on average, 170 communications with the agency um, per rule. Now, if we only count the informal engagements, here's a draft rule, what do you think of it? It was 80, 80 communications in the development stage per rule. Public interest logged in at less than one. Um, so industry was very heavily involved in how the rule was being developed. Um, and so the rule that was proposed came out of this. We have no idea substantively what this means in terms of the proposal. I have no idea how to test that, although it would be really interesting beyond the interviews because uh, we have no sort of benchmark. <coughs> Notice in comments, um, industry again, public interest. For every 17 comments filed by industry, one was filed by the public interest, and we already know they weren't <coughs> in half the rules. So then when we did look at influence, we saw that two-thirds of the changes that EPA made to the final rule from the proposed, which again already went through all this vetting, um, weakened the rule. Um, and then when changes were suggested to strengthen the rule, they were actually rejected more often than the changes weakened the rule. Um, so, we see essentially a rulemaking record that looks like it probably was very responsive to industry. I don't <coughs> want to overstate the case, but I, it looks like, given the input and also the evidence of weakening for proposed to final. Now, you know, frankly, reinforcing this is the fact that environmentalists were winning on Chevron step one every single time except one where they brought those challenges. So that the agency, when we do have insights into the rules, we saw the agencies violating the statute. Um, so all this combined may tell a story that maybe industry didn't have a whole lot, lot you know, left that it really needed. Um, at least in a cost-benefit sense, maybe it had pretty much gotten all the concessions it needed. Maybe it even struck deals with EPA uh, that you give me this and I won't sue. And I'm guessing some of that will occur. I think interviews would be very helpful. So why did they only sue one case? It could well be that there was not a whole left a lot left that they thought they wanted to do, and they wanted to not anger EPA. And I wanted to show you in the one case they did file down here successfully, this actually was only two little industries that broke from the larger path, and they thought the monitoring requirements were arbitrary. It was one issue, it was a small issue, it was only two little industries that did it. Um, so what do we conclude from this? Again, you know, from such a small study, I think all it does is present a bunch of questions. Um, but if I had to kind of give a synopsis, step one is, boy, are the courts really impacting agencies, and if so, how? You know, are the agencies as attentive to court opinion substantively as I think in administrative law, at least, we haven't assumed them to be? I think that needs more investigation. And again, maybe empirics uh, supplemented by a lot of interviews and case studies. Step two, though, let's assume that judicial review matters, that the agencies really are responsive at the end of the day. Maybe on the third reminder, they actually take those constraints to heart. Then what does it look like? This is a, just a, a very tentative sketch. It seems to me we really have a bimodal distribution in the effect of, of the administrative process on the rules. One sector of rules where we have more even engagement, we actually have public interest filing comments, for example. We have kind of the stakeholder balance in one mode probably looks like judicial review, if the agency follows it, matters. Um, that the agency gets reprimanded, knows what the statute should be interpreted, and that our, our view of the administrative process actually holds forth here, okay? Um, the other mode, though, could be the majority of rules. And in this set of rules, we have only industry, we have a monolith engaging. Um, the only threat is from industry with regard to judicial and in fact, we could <coughs> expect them, the agency, if it's trying to go an even course, repeatedly compromising in favor of industry to stave off judicial review, to try to create a rule that can just make it through. But ironically, that means in that mode, judicial review is really taking us away from the public interest in completely unaccountable ways. Now that would say we need to rethink institutionally what to do with all this. But that's kind of, if that is, happening. It seems to me that's kind of a dramatic institutional problem that we could have on our hands based on pluralism. 
And I wanted to just show you one more quick slide. This is the industry, just to give you sort of a, a case study sort of sense of what we looked at. The industry win, the Arteva case, I told you it was two individual industries that broke. This is what the rulemaking process looked like. There was no public interest involvement in the rule beginning to end at all in this one that they won. They filed 450 communications with the agency before the proposed rule was published. They submitted 36 comments. One state commented once. No public interest engagement. EPA made 20 changes to the proposed rule. All of them weakened it. Uh, it rejected six other changes asking for weakening. They petitioned twice that they would sue. EPA settled and revised the rule twice in response to their rule petitions. Still unhappy, the two industry petitioners sued EPA um, and prevailed in a court with two Democrats and one Republican. Um, pretty dramatic. So uh, now I will hush up, hush up, as they say in Texas. Um, 